Welcome to my build tutorial for the Godzilla 1964 vinyl model kit sculpted by Yuji Sakai and released by Kyoto of Japan in the early 1990s. This was one of Sakai's first commercially released model kits. I'll start a kit by first doing a parts inventory and identifying that all parts are accounted for and in good condition. Also familiarize myself with these parts that need to be trimmed of excess vinyl. As you can see, most of the parts have about an inch to two inches worth of excess vinyl that will need to be removed before the parts can be assembled. Some parts, like the tail, also have sealed ends, which may or may not need to be cut out to join the various parts of the tail together. To trim the parts, I first heat up a part with a hot hair dryer for about 30 seconds to a minute which makes it very soft and pliable and easy to cut with an X-Acto knife. While the vinyl is still warm and pliable, you then cut the excess material off with an X-Acto knife, taking great care not to get your fingers in the process. Once I've cut off all the excess material on the parts, I will use a Dremel with a barrel sander tool to further remove any excess material on the edges that I didn't get with the X-Acto knife. During this process, I will also smooth out any irregular edges to minimize any gaps between two parts when they're glued together. Also, the barrel sander roughs up the edge of the part, which helps glue stick the parts together better than a totally smooth part. I use 60 grit or 80 grit sandpaper to further remove any burrs and rough up the edge of the parts that will join together.
At this point, the kit's ready to be assembled, but first, the mold release, which is an oily residue on the outside of the vinyl, needs to be cleaned off with hot water and usually dishwasher soap. What I do is I just throw them in the sink with some dishwashing soap and some hot water and scrub them with a toothbrush, rinse them off, and let them dry overnight. <laughs> Now I'm ready to begin putting the model together. I'll start with the sub-assemblies, which is the arms to the hands, the feet to the legs, uh, the four pieces of the tail together. And what I do is I start by tacking a piece together from one point and then working my way around a seam to get as good and as clean a fit as I possibly can just by tacking. I start out by using a blow dryer once again to soften the parts. As you can see here, the part's nice and soft and pliable, easy for me to move around to get an area I want joined together, a nice, smooth, clean join. Add a little bit of thick super glue. Spread it around between the two parts, just in a little area that I want to tack. I'm not doing the whole thing at once. Stick them together. Apply a little pressure to hold them together. And then I'll use some zap kicker on a, on a paint skewer. As you can see, it turns instantly white, which means it's setting quickly. knock off the excess there, chips off real easy. And then I'll work my way around the entire join here to get as best a fit as I possibly can at this stage. The reason being is the better the fit now, the less seam filling I will have to do in the next stage of the assembly of the kit. Here with the feet, they're pretty pliable when they're heated. And as you can see, the joint's not a very good clean fit. So I'll use a homemade tool, which is basically just a piece of brass bent uh, like a hook to pull the two pieces together and again, try to make as good and as clean a fit as I possibly can at this stage, which means less work blending and filling later. At this point, I'm ready to start filling gaps and blending seams. To do this, I use two-part JB Weld, which works excellent with vinyl. It's a good bonder and it hardens overnight rock hard and can be sanded just like resin. I can apply it with any kind of tool I want uh, right down to using a toothpick as I did in this case. I'm not really concerned on flat surfaces how it looks when I apply it because once it's dry I can grind it flush with the vinyl material, such as on the underside of the foot here, where it's still a pretty rough looking joint. Now the inside of the leg, as you can see here, is pretty thin vinyl. And that's a bit of a problem when it comes to supporting the whole weight of the finished model. <laughs> Once 
what I use is Smoothcast 300 two-part resin. You mix it same amount, half and half, in a cup, and it dries within about two to three minutes, rock hard. I mix it, and I fill up the leg about to the knee uh, with the liquid resin. This will harden and add stability and weight to the bottom of the kit. As you can see here, even as I'm pouring it, it's already starting to harden in the cup. Here, I'm using the Dremel tool to grind and blend the JB Weld material that I've used to smooth out and fill gaps in the joints between several parts. As you can see, it grinds pretty much just like resin. It blends really well with the vinyl material. Um, I can smooth it out with sandpaper to make a virtually invisible blend between the two parts. I'm now ready to join the legs to the main body part. As you can see here, I've cut some small holes in each side of the body where the legs will attach. This is so I can get my fingers in through the inside of the body, as well as in case I need to pour more resin into the legs once the legs are attached to add further stability to the body. As can be seen, even though I've done a good job of trimming the parts, it's still going to have significant gaps where the legs attach to the body. Once again, I will start by attaching a critical point, usually at the top of the leg, where it's most visible and work my way around the periphery of the leg and the body to join the parts. Once again, I'm heating the parts with a blow dryer as I tack them together, making it soft and pliable so I can push it together areas where there might be some gap and then add glue sticking them together. As you can see, the parts are still warm and easy to manipulate. A little glue, holding it down together. A little zap kicker to set it, and it's good to go. At this point, I've attached the legs and the arms to the body permanently. The tail is inserted temporarily. A problem with this particular kit is because of the tail and the awkward pose, it is not balanced. Therefore, what I'm going to have to do is fill the front of the body cavity with two-part resin. As you can see here, the resin has dried. It's in the front chest area, and it should give the body perfect balance with the tail attached. If not, I would fill it further with more resin in the front. Let's see if it stands up. And there you go. I'm ready to start attaching the fins to the body and the tail. As the directions show, some of the fins come on trees while others are individual parts. 
All the parts are numbered, but they're very hard to see, as well as the numbering corresponding on the body. So I use a silver pen to mark the fins and the body with the corresponding numbers, as well as arrows showing which directions the fins should be pointing in. As there are three rows, I also mark the trees, the right, the left, and the centers. It is important, especially for the larger fins, to be pointing in the proper direction towards the head. For painting a typical vinyl kit, like this Godzilla kit, I keep it pretty simple. I use Tamiya flat acrylics and I stick with basically primary colors, flat black, flat white, the free primary colors, and a few secondary colors. To get certain values, I'll mix the colors by eye to get, say, a warm flesh color. And for the airbrush, I will use Tamiya thinner or alcohol. For sealing, I'll use Mr. Hobby top coats and especially the Mr. Hobby Super Clear gloss if needed uh, and the Super Clear flat. For primering, it's Mr. Hobby and Tamiya flat white or black primers, which stick really good to vinyl. Now it's really important that I use 99% alcohol a lot when I thin my paints in the airbrush because it goes on very flat. And then I use Mod Podge uh, gloss usually for like teeth and the inside of the mouth or claws. And of course I'll mix it for large amounts of paint in a bottle. And this is my trusty Iwata BCS airbrush. I've had this one airbrush for over 25 years and I've never replaced it. Now I'm ready to start primering the kit. I'll start with uh, Mr. Surfacer Black for the body. Uh, it provides a really good barrier between the vinyl and whatever acrylic coatings I'm going to be doing. It dries fast. And then for the fins, I'm just going to go with the Tamiya Surface Primer White. Um, it too provides a good barrier and it goes on pretty strong with one coat. I don't need to do multiple coats to get a nice white base. One of the things uh, that's a problem with this kit is that one of the fins in the back overlaps two other fins on either side of it. So to get an accurate paint on this particular piece, I'm not going to attach it until after the part's completely painted. That way there won't be any hazing or shading with the airbrush and I won't have to deal with bending it to get behind the fin between the two spaces where it touches the other fin. Now I'm ready to begin painting the kit. I start with the fins going from light to dark. I mix my colors directly into the airbrush cup for small areas of coverage or a jar for larger areas that I need to paint. As you can see here, I do it by eye. A little bit of white, just a tiny bit of orange to get an off-white warm color. Mix it right in the cup. And then I'll add a little bit of either 99% rubbing alcohol or the Tamiya thinner to thin the paint for the airbrush.
It will take me several passes on the fins in this case to get the graduated light to dark values I want for the edge of the fins and the, the bumps that are on the fins as well. Once I get the off-white uh, color of the fins, I seal it with Mr. Super Clear Matte or Flat. Uh, the reason being is not just to seal the paint and bond it to the uh, kit, but also as a sealant when I do reverse painting, a technique I'll go into in my next step. Now I will demonstrate my reverse painting technique. Reverse painting is where I paint a part, usually a jaw or some other detail, and uh, use multiple colors, often bright and gaudy, uh, for the base flesh colors of the inside of the mouth and the base of the teeth, and seal those colors and then give it the overcoat of the, in this case, the off-white teeth. I don't seal the overcoat, and I use the airbrush with 99% rubbing alcohol, which will blast away the white overcoat, revealing the colors underneath, which are sealed and won't get blasted away by the airbrush. The goal of this technique is simply to create random patterns that look much more naturalistic than as if I was trying to do it with a paintbrush and painting by hand. As I blast away the white, you can see that it flows away from the direction of the airbrush, creating new patterns and lines in the part that aren't really evident uh, in the part's uh, sculpt. With a part like the mouth, I may have to do this technique two, maybe three times to get the desired effect. Painting, sealing, laying on my overcoat, blasting it away, sealing it, and then painting some more color onto it, and again, blasting some away to get the final result. I also use this technique heavily on the uh, fins on the back. Um, again, I start off by painting them uh, bright colors, reds, blues, greens, yellows, oranges, pretty psychedelic looking. Uh, seal the colors and then lay on several, several coats of different shades of uh, lighter white or off-white um, and then blast off the ends of the spines to reveal the colors underneath uh, and the colors of the, the bumps. Again, 
I may have to do this two, three times to get a final desired effect. And that effect in this case is exposed bones on the edges of the spine and the blisters or warts on the sides of the spines. Once I have a finished effect, I'll seal the, the fin to be later coated by the basic gray of the uh, entire suit. And I'm not limited to just using the airbrush to do this technique. I will use a regular brush and dry brush, though 99% alcohol, to get uh, larger areas or to create uh, paint flow uh, in specific spots that I, I want uh, more coverage or that are harder to get from the airbrush. Most kits that I do, uh, I paint the eyes in the traditional fashion with airbrush and paintbrush and get extremely satisfactory, realistic results, especially with smaller kits in the 20 to 30 centimeter range uh, and mostly with resin kits. However, over the years, I've looked at other options to make realistic eyes, especially perfectly round, uh, which you'd find on some of the Godzilla figures, especially in the 90s. One of the options I came up with was designing them in Adobe Illustrator and printing them out on a color printer on a sheet of decal paper. I would then cut out the appropriately sized eyes uh, and apply them as water slide decals on a kit. This would often yield very satisfactory results, but I still found the technique limiting. The Godzilla 62 and especially the 1964 suits featured a unique design for the eye. The eyeball itself was a fixed part that was encased in a clear plastic outer sphere. This gave it a unique three-dimensional look. The large 50 centimeter scale vinyl M1 Gamma 96 kit was one of the first kits I discovered that had an actual multi-part clear plastic eye that replicated the look I was looking for in a larger kit. To achieve this effect, one of the first techniques I came up with was forming the outer eye shell using Plastruck sheet or Duralar sheet, uh, which is a clear plastic and is easily formable by heating it with a heat gun. To do this, I would cut out a small square section of plastic and I would use something like a ball bearing, a marble, or in this case, a acrylic sphere glued to a stem to hold it properly. The way it works is I heat the plastic to the point it's almost melting and then press in the sphere to make an impression.
I'm heating the plastic to the point it's almost melting. I have to work quickly to press the acrylic ball into the plastic to make my impression. Sometimes it takes two or three tries to get a good clean impression. Once the plastic has cooled and I have my uh, impression, I can cut it out and I will have my little eyeball cover. I've used this particular technique on several vinyl kits. My first try was on a modified Kyoto Godzilla 1964 kit. Uh, and as you can see here, the eyes look pretty realistic uh, in relation to the suit. In my quest to make better looking, more realistic eyes, especially for the larger vinyl kits, um, I've leaned towards using solid uh, plastic acrylic balls or their half hemispheres, uh, which are hollow, uh, to get uh, more realistic three-dimensional eyes. Some of my attempts have not been so successful, but um, eventually I came across the uh, method of cutting the solid spheres in halves or quarters and hollowing out the iris from the back and painting it, which gives it a much more three-dimensional realistic look. Here's some samples and rejects uh, where I've tried different techniques. Um, some of these are more similar to typical taxidermy eyes uh, where the backside is flat and I've simply painted the uh, eye on the backside of the cut in half sphere and um, it gives a good effect but it's not quite as three-dimensional as I was shooting for. As you can see they're more similar to doll's eyes in this case. Here I'm going to make the eyes for this kit. I'm using a 3 8 clear acrylic plastic uh, ball and I'm going to cut it in half with a Dremel tool. I have to be very careful here. Uh, the only way I can safely hold it is between my fingers and as I'm cutting it, because it's plastic, the uh, uh, excess material is actually melted hot plastic which I have to continually knock off of the ball as I cut it. Once I've cut the ball all the way around in half I can just basically crack it apart uh, to get two pieces. At this point, I need to sand the back sides to get an almost mirror finish. Of course, I'm going to start off with some 60 or 80 grit sandpaper and grind off the roughest edges here uh, and then work my way down to uh, 600 and eventually 800 wet dry sandpaper to get an almost glass finish. This whole process of sanding it from the moment I cut it in half to where I get the glassy finish only takes about 15 minutes because it's plastic and it sands really easily.
Here I've cut the inside of the mouth and the uh, eye uh, areas out. Uh, the head's hollow, so I don't need to do much further grinding to uh, test fit the eyes into the uh, inside socket. As you can see here, I don't have to do very much work to get a really good fit. My next step is, is I have to grind out with a Dremel tool the dimple in the back side of the plastic eye uh, to give it a three-dimensional uh, iris effect. Once I have the eye grounded out to the proper size, I do a final test fit to make sure that the iris is the right size and the eye has a nice clean fit. One of the problems with grinding it out is that it's very difficult to sand the inside to get a nice smooth surface. The workaround for this is to use some Plastruck weld to uh, melt the inside of the uh, iris to get a nice smooth finish. Using the brush, I just paint a little bit of it inside the eye. It melts the plastic and gives me a nice smooth finish. To affix the eye to the inside of the head, I'm going to cut some tabs out of some of the excess vinyl that I originally trimmed off the kit parts and I will use JB Quick Weld to glue them inside the head. This way I'm using the tab to hold the eye inside the head and not actually glopping the JB Weld all around the inside of the eye potentially damaging the paint job of the eye or having it ooze out between the eye and the outside of the eyelids of the kit. Now here is the head with the eyes glued inside. It's a little difficult to see here, but you can see how the tabs are holding the eyes in place. Once that set, I did add some more JB Weld around more of the tabs to give it a firm, permanent 
uh, hold on the uh, parts. And then use kneaded eraser uh, to protect the outside of the eyes from getting paint on them when I eventually paint the head. As you can see here, the eyes are masked and I will leave the kneaded eraser uh, on the uh, eye parts until I am pretty much done painting the kit. Now I'm ready to uh, affix the uh, upper jaw and seal up the head uh, to the kit. As you can see here, it's a pretty nice fit. Um, I'm not going to have to do a lot of puttying to uh, blend any seams. Once I've puttied the, around the mouth, I will uh, paint the rest of the inside of the face. And uh, my last step will be affixing the lower jaw to the kit. At this point, I'm ready to finish detailing the uh, head part, uh, and I'm going to uh, apply some washes to the inside of the jaws uh, around the teeth to bring out some more detail in the sculpt. I'm just, again, using simple acrylic uh, paints, uh, thinned out to an almost watery consistency, and applying them as, as like a wash uh, inside the mouth around the teeth. I'm now ready to paint the body the dark gray. To do so, I first need to mask off the mouth, the uh, toenails, and the claws on the hands uh, to prevent them from getting uh, oversprayed gray. To do that, once again, I rely on uh, the kneaded eraser. I'll just break off some bits and cover each individual toenail and fingernail and the entire mouth. As you can see, the kit has a lot of bright, multicolored uh, paint applications to the head and to the fins and the bottoms of the feet. Um, this is all sealed and when I overpaint it with the gray, I will be, again, blasting it off using the reverse painting technique uh, to bring out these colors underneath the uh, final dark gray body color. All right, 
Here I'm going to make a bottle of the dark gray charcoal color that makes up the uh, overall color of the figure. As you see here, I add a little bit of light blue to the white before I even start adding black. Uh, this is to give the charcoal gray a cooler value. As you can see here, I mix the colors once again by eye. Um, I'm going to keep adding black until I get it to the value I'm looking for. Once I get the appropriate color, I'm going to thin it with the 99% rubbing alcohol so that when I apply it with an airbrush, it will lay down very flat. Now here I've uh, airbrushed uh, mostly the back fins uh, and part of the tail uh, with the uh, dark charcoal gray. And now I'm going to blast it off with a reverse painting technique with the 99% rubbing alcohol. Again, the colors underneath the gray are sealed, but the gray itself is not sealed.
Here's a view of the partially finished uh, reverse painting pass on the fins. As you can see, the technique gives a nice interesting uh, appearance of the uh, edges of the fins being worn or burned off. At this point, I'm ready to add that final fin, uh, which has also been painted by itself. Here the kit is almost completely painted and I'm down to doing detailing by hand. Uh, similar to the reverse painting technique, I'm using a cotton swab with some 99% rubbing alcohol to rub off the unsealed charcoal gray body color to reveal uh, fine detail on the fins. Other techniques I will use at this stage include dry brush painting and uh, using a sponge uh, with some thinned out washes to uh, get the dirty uh, appearance of the suit. Once again, one of the final things I'll be doing is on the toes and fingers using washes to bring out detail. Finally, once the kit is sealed, uh, the last thing I'll probably do here is use Mod Podge uh, and dab little areas with the gloss coating uh, to bring out uh, the wet look on the face and on the fins and in the teeth. <laughs> 